uh, sort of ongoing research and, and some very new results for uh, a project where we're using archaeogenomics to focus on uh, the evolution of natural history, ultimately the domestication of wild cucurbita, the, the progenitor of squashes and gourds. By archaeogenomics, I'm, I'm referring to genome scale recovery, sequencing, and analysis of ancient DNA from archaeological contexts, and using that in conjunction with ecological principles, the archaeological record. Uh, computational genomics and un other tools to really sort of reconstruct a holistic picture of what's going on in the world of cucurbita going all the way back into the Pleistocene. There we are. So this is wild cucurbita. There's 14 or so extant species spread throughout the Americas. And this is sort of a typical fruit form. Uh, it's anatomically a pivo. It's an indehiscent fruit. It's quite tough. Um, and it's impermeable to water and most anything else. Cucurbitaceous plants are well known for being very adept at long distance dispersal on uh, oceanic currents and, and river systems and flooding events. Um, they're also extremely well adapted for dispersal by megafauna, by large mammals. And in fact, we have evidence for this very behavior uh, associated with cucurbit in the New World. We have several uh, Pleistocene dung deposits from mastodons sites in Florida dating back to about 30,000 years before the present, and sure enough, they are full of cucurbita seeds. So megafauna, and particularly the New World Pleistocene megafauna, really did seem to be instrumental in the dispersal strategy of these fruits. But all of the megafaunal herbivores in the Americas went extinct, moving into the hulls. And so that left cucurbita without their naturally evolved dispersal uh, mutualists. This put them squarely in the category of, whoop, there we are, of ecological anachronisms. This was uh, a term coined by Jansen and Martin in the early 1980s in the science paper. It used to describe a plant that's really removed temporally from its co-evolved dispersal partner by virtue of extinction events or other sorts of ecological shifts. The new world is absolutely packed full of these anachronistic species. A few examples here, avocado, cacao, uh, horse apple, uh, osage orange on the bottom left, and, and uh, honey locust on the bottom right. These share a few characteristics. Um, one is that they're kind of, they've been described as, by Connie Barlow, as sort of overbuilt species. They really seem like anatomical overkill for the ecological niches that they're occupying today. It seems like they're a remnant of something in the past. Another hallmark of these is that they carry uh, a pretty serious arsenal of both chemical and physical defenses. Um, for example, uh, avocados, several parts of those, have some moderately toxic al alkaloids. Cacao is chock full of alkaloids. Um, it's part of what makes it attractive to us. The Osage orange has some nasty milky saps, and of course, there are these physical armaments that are, are very much a deterrent to smaller mammals, although they might not be as effective as you know, warding off the actual dispersal, mutual, dispersal mutualists upon which these plants rely during the Pleistocene. So, while populations of cucurbita seem like they have probably declined in the Holocene. This is uh, a map compiled by Gail Fritz uh, for a, sorry? Could you use the microphone? Yeah, of course. Please. Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. I tend to move around a bit, so. You gotta stay there. So these are some archeological sites compiled by, by Gail Fritz. Uh, sort of illustrating the range of cucurbita used prehistorically, and I added just a few to those, the Morton Shell Mount site, the Delta, and Bilbo sites, uh, to sort of illustrate the coastal range as well. And so, uh, some of this is probably culturally mediated, some of this range, especially these uh, high latitude sites up at Cherro and possibly Memorial Park. But, uh, since we do find sort of wild type and weedy seeds throughout much of this range, and certainly along the coast, uh, we might expect that this was in some ways illustrative of the ancient range of wild cucurbita, whereas now these things in the eastern woodlands are really sort of relegated to these uh, refugial patches, these sort of relict populations that seem like they represent what's left of a once much larger contiguous population. Another example is a, a variant of cucurbita people, a subspecies people, which is a prolific group of cultivars. This originated, we know, archaeologically in, in southern Mexico around 10,000 years before the present, but we don't have any evidence that this crop exists in the wild in that region now, so it seems like there was a population collapse in southern Mexico. Cucurbita moschata is another example. This is butternut squashes and hundreds of other cultivars. 
uh, that's a, an extremely diverse and prolific crop plant, but it's completely unknown in the wild. It's presumed to have come from the New World uh, lowland tropics, but that's about all we know about it. So for whatever reason, uh, Cucurbita has seemingly declined in the wild, and we want to sort of test the possibility that this anachronistic bearing, this fact that the natural dispersers are all gone, contributed to that. And so let's look anatomically just for a moment. We do know that Cucurbita carries some of the Fences that ward off smaller, uh, smaller animals and alternative dispersers that carry a tough rind. Uh, it's really quite confirmed, it wasn't mentioned. And they also uh, synthesize some of the most bitter compounds known in nature, cucurbitacins. These are really, really strongly bitter to smaller mammals and they're moderately toxic. And by that I mean uh, livestock who are desperate and forced to eat wild boards have approached lethal dose and have actually surpassed lethal and there are a few documented cases of humans dying from uh, cucurbitacin toxicity, although it's quite rare. They don't seem to pose any problem for large herbivores, we know from the mastodon cases, and we also know from elephants dispersing cucurbitaceous plants that they seem to be fine with it, but they are likely unpalatable to extant New World mammals. So it seems like there might be something associated with body size. So to, pardon, okay. So on the other side, while these plants are declining in the wild, possibly from, from some combination of ecological events, including dispersal extinction, we see their absolute uh, thriving in, in domestic relationships with humans. There's at least six known domestic uh, sort of major lineages of uh, Kikurita. Here are just a few examples, and I won't get into the sort of the nitty gritty of the taxonomy here, because I'm trying to focus a little more on the group as a whole, and we don't need to, to worry with that. Suffice it to say that these things have done very well in cultivated relationships with humans, and uh, they've been bred for a tremendous range of phenotypic variability. They probably started as things like container crops and, and fishnet floats. Um, this has been detailed by various researchers, but because they're so bitter, because they're so tough, they wouldn't necessarily have been an attractive food crop until um, some more genetic levels of domestication had taken place. So to test, uh, we kind of wanted to go into this to test the decline of the wild population simultaneously with trying to understand from an archaeogenomic perspective the emergence of these domestic lineages in order to try and sort of paint a holistic picture of what's going on. So the first part is focusing on the sensory ecology and specifically testing this cucurbitacin bitterness, this chemical defense, as a particular part of a megafaunal dispersal strategy. So the specific hypothesis going into this is that smaller mammals are actually much more perceptive of bitter tasting compounds, making them unsuitable cucurbit dispersers. And the reason for this hypothesis has to do with the fact that physiologically, a small mammal needs to be able to detect these environmental detoxins uh, much more acutely than a very large one. So to test this, we took uh, 42 published mammal genomes, basically all the placental mammal genomes of decent quality, and we screened them for bitter tasting genes in order to sort of reconstruct sensory ecology across all the mammals we could. These were across a range of ecological types and forms, just a small sampling of which you see here. So what we were screening for are these TAS2R genes, we'll call them tasters. They're a family of bitter taste receptors, and they have variable copy numbers between different species, with more copies indicating a greater breadth of bitter taste perception. Humans have 25, and if you have any particular uh, aversion to black coffee, for example, you have a taster gene to thank for that. We found 834 intact taster genes across these 42 species, and we were able to sort of um, start uh, analyzing the patterns that we found there. They range from four copies in a two-toed sloth to 44 copies in a common shoe. So again, revisiting the, the hypothesis that body size tracks uh, in some way the ability to taste bitter compounds, we can plot the, uh, the, the bitter tasting acuity on the y-axis along with body size on the x, and we do find uh, a quite significant negative correlation between body size and bitter tasting acuity. Then if we take each of those 42 species and we give them a variable uh, indica indicating diet breadth, so with one to, mm, between one and four, with one indicating an extremely broad spectrum generalist, a mouse, a rat, a chimpanzee, a human, call the one, and four, indicating a specialist. Something like polar bear, giant panda, a sloth, these very highly uh, specialized things. And we might predict that more specialized animals have less developed bitter tasting abil abilities by virtue of the fact that they're not sampling so much of the environment. 
they don't need to detect all these toxins. And when we plot that out, we find a really quite strong correlation uh, between bitter tasting acuity and diet breadth. So what this comes down to is that small generalists, uh, sort of extreme examples being a shrew or a mouse, are really, really good at tasting bitter compounds. Whereas large specialists, something like a polar bear or a manatee, sloth isn't quite as large, but it's, it's an extreme case, are not so good at tasting. The implications of this for key curvature to dispersal are that it really might have been in trouble when the megafauna went extinct in the New World, because most of what was left were uh, not highly specialized and they weren't very big, which means they were probably quite good at tasting their compounds. So that's, that's sort of, we'll leave the, the sensory ecology bit for the moment and we'll get into um, to sort of trying to understand the phylogenetic patterning of some of these domestic lineages using archaeogenomics, using ancient DNA. So what we did was we sequenced whole plastid genomes in 85 specimens across taxonomic and, and temporal and geographic breadth uh, to the degree that we could. 13 of these were ancient uh, from the sites uh, shown on the map, five from the Ozark shelters, um, seven from Mexico, and one sample from Philip Spring. And 72 were modern to sort of provide the, the context and, and the baseline information that we need to, to start reconstructing phylogenetic uh, patterns. Pardon. With these data, of course, uh, on the right is, uh, is our, our clean lab facility. This is uh, working with ancient DNA. It's critical to, to observe contamination protocols and to sort of work within the stringency bounds that are required to recover and analyze ancient DNA in that contamination free context. So we were able to reconstruct these complete plastic genomes and, and, and rebuild a, a quite high resolution tree um, across the entire genes. And we're not going to look at this as a whole, we're going to zoom into a couple of different species, Cucurbita pico and Cucurbita moschata, which is where we focused a lot of our sequencing, and this is where a lot of the, the economic value of the species exists. So Cucurbita pico, this breaks down into three uh, well-supported groups that are classified formally as subspecies, um, and we found support for that. Cucurbita pico subspecies pico, this bottom group, here, uh, that's, that's one that I mentioned was from uh, southern Mexico beginning around 10,000 years before the present. It's completely gone from the wild now, as far as we know. Subspecies fraterna, the one in the middle, that's a punctually endemic form from uh, around Tamaulipas, Mexico. It's not known in a tremendous volume of populations, but there's a few wild populations out there. And Cucurbita people's subspecies of Obifera contains several things. It contains a cultivar group, including things like scallop squashes and acorn squashes. It contains Eastern North American wild types uh, in the present, and it also contains ancient Eastern North American archaeological um, So a couple of things I want to draw your attention to here is that uh, the, the origins of the Odifera lineage have been debated. They have been uh, alternatively suggested to be Eastern North American, sort of native, uh, as part of that local crop complex, or uh, they've been suggested to be introduced from northeastern Mexico. And we find quite strong evidence here that the, the eastern North American wild types, the modern wild types, as well as the archaeological types, are all grouped in with that obifera lineage, which does provide strong support for that native domestication event, which has been indicated archaeologically. Beyond that, we find there's an archaeological example. By the way, I didn't mention the red tips on this tree are the ancient ones. I should have made that clear. Much of there is an archaeological example of Cucurbitus people subspecies fraterna from northeastern Mexico, from a place called Romero's Cave. This appears to be uh, a domestic in morphology. It's got some domestic characteristics. I don't have a photo. I wish I did. But suffice it to say that it seems like there's this domestic form that's just completely dropped out of a uh, modern domestic germplasm, possibly an incipient domestic form. Also, in eastern North America, we have these five sites in the Ozarks, which form a uh, sort of marginally well-supported subgroup, these guys right here. And what that's indicating, and there's some variation in that that we don't see in modern domestic forms. Um, again, showing that there were some lineages that were being brought into domestication that seemed to have been sort of being culled or were dropped out, ultimately, uh, between prehistory and the time when we have these, these modern prolific cultivars being grown commercially. Now let's take one quick look at Cucurita Moschata and most of these are pretty invariant, and you can't tell them apart using the plastic genome. It just doesn't have the resolution. However, there are two additional long branches on this 
treat, this decoded must try to treat, indicating a substantial level of genetic differentiation. One example from Romero's cave in, in northeastern Mexico, and another example from a couple of modern cultivars. What this suggests, and we don't have the resolution with these data precisely, um, and we also, this is not a calibrated tree, so we can't put a molecular clock on estimate on this in the state it's currently in. But what this might suggest is that Cucurbita muschata domestication was a fairly broad scale thing. It might not have drawn on a single founder population. We might be looking at a situation where sort of Cucurbita muschata, which is unknown in the wild today, was broadly distributed throughout the lowly neotropics and it was being sort of picked up and used um, opportunistically throughout much of its range. Then as the wild populations dropped out, some of those plants ended up uh, forming really full-scale domestic relationships with humans. Some of those lineages made it present, others did not, as the case with Romero's cave. So just to kind of summarize a working model for, for cucurbit based on all this information, I would argue that domestication was a widespread phenomenon. We know that because there were, there were six or more independent domestic lineages, um, probably as the case with, with uh, cucurbit muschata, I'm hoping it illustrates. Um, even within some of these individual species, it was a geographically and temporally widespread and culturally widespread process, the emergence of these domestic forms. I would argue that, that domestication, colonizing the human landscape, was an adaptive strategy for what was fundamentally an anachronistic species on the decline. And so, uh, rind softening and bitter chemical suppression um, during domestication was ultimately an evolutionary advantage as these these words were going into a symbiotic relationship with humans. And just to conclude, I'd like to, to bring up an idea we've just been talking about in the last couple days, having to do with reproductive isolation of domestic plants. Domestic plants don't need to be reproductive, reproductively isolated to be successful, but it can really help in terms of the fixation of the alleles and the phenotypes associated with a domestic form or a form that's attractive to humans. With cucurbita, it would have been really essential to reproductively isolate these domestic populations so that you didn't have the gene flow from the wild plants reintroducing constantly the bitterness and the hard rinds that would have made them a sort of inaccessible foodstuffs. There are historic accounts of people planting uh, wild board plants near the, the fields of enemies to cross-pollinate and, and make all their foods unpalatable, <laughs> illustrating sort of the, the transferability of these genes. So in many cases, wheats in, in the Levant, for example, and, and to some degree maize in Central America, this reproductive isolation is based on cultural activity. It's humans who have to carry these plants away from their native range. In this case, we might be dealing with a situation where uh, sort of a, an incipient uh, cultivation relationship <coughs> ends, and then the wild type drops away as wild populations collapse. So it could be that the, the wild population declines, which we would argue have something to do with their dispersal anachronism, might have actually strengthened the selection pressures and led to the fixation uh, in some way of these domestication alleles and phenotypes. Just a new idea, and I'd be happy to talk that out with anybody afterward. I'd like to acknowledge a few funding organizations and a few individuals for sample materials and a few organizations, and I thank you very much for your time. There are time for questions. Uh, any questions for Yes. Yeah, you talked about uh, Northern American cucurbita uh, germplasm, but did you also consider uh, germplasm from the Andes? Because, as far as I know, cucurbita uh, maxima was originally domesticated in the Andes, right? Yes, absolutely. Yes, so cucurbita maxima, and it's also been proposed that cucurbita ecuadorensis uh, was at one time a domestic form based on, based on modern diversity and microfossils. So yeah, that's something we absolutely would like to look more at. We've been focusing on North and Central America basically um, as a place to start and because we have uh, archaeological materials of excellent preservation that we have access to. So I'd love to look more at the second yeah. The idea I really think you ought to add South America because there is a great corpus of very early uh, seeds. Oh, absolutely. Of 3000 BC, easy. Yes. No, I agree entirely. <laughs> okay, thank you. That concludes our session. And thank you, everyone.